Hello, and welcome to the digital launch of the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture in its new home, the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Jennifer Wilkes, and I have the honor of serving as director of the Warfield Center. Established at Florida International University in 1999, the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture honors the late Dr. Eric Williams, scholar, statesman, and head of the government of Trinidad and Tobago from 1956 until his death in 1981. Among numerous books, Williams authored Capitalism and Slavery, published in 1944, the landmark study that has been translated into 10 languages and that is still widely read today. In the University of North Carolina Press edition of Capitalism and Slavery, Colin Palmer, late of Princeton University, describes the book as follows, quote, few modern historical works have enjoyed the enduring intellectual impact and appeal of Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery. It is a work of conceptual brilliance, intellectually mature, bold, incisive, and immensely provocative. Its publication marked an important watershed in the historiography of the Caribbean, but its ramifications extended beyond the Caribbean. Williams established the centrality of African slavery and the slave trade to the English economy. His conclusions may be rejected, but no serious scholar can avoid confronting the important questions the book poses." End quote. In a similar vein, Duke University professor William Darity has stated that with capitalism and slavery, Williams, quote, managed to produce a work that now has to be considered central in the historiography of slavery and abolition, end quote. The Eric Williams Memorial Lecture continues in this legacy by hosting conversations about global activism and art from Williams's time to the present. The series has moved to UT Austin with the generous support of co-founders Erica Williams Connell and Dr. Carol Boyce Davies in collaboration with Warfield Center affiliates, Drs. Lorraine Liu and Minka Makalani. Daughter of the series namesake, Williams Connell is the founding curator of the Eric Williams Memorial Collection at the University of the West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. Boyce Davies was a professor of African Diaspora Studies and English at Florida International University, and is currently Frank H. T. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters in the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Africana Studies and English at Cornell University. The Warfield Center is marking the occasion by curating a collection of interviews with Williams Connell, Boyce Davies, and previous lecture speakers. These conversations are streaming in conjunction with a digital exhibition, Celebrating Eric Williams, co-coordinated between the Eric Williams Memorial Collection and UT's Black Diaspora Archive. The digital launch continues with bridging community knowledge and scholarship. Dr. Carol Boyce Davies on the genesis of the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. It was my pleasure to facilitate this conversation, and I'd like to thank Warfield Center Events Coordinator Justice Madden for bringing us together. Finally, thank you for joining the Warfield Center community as we celebrate the legacy of Eric Williams, reflect on the lecture series history at Florida International University, and prepare for the inaugural UT-based lecture in spring 2022. My name is Jennifer Wilkes, and I am director of the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies. Today, I'm honored to be in conversation with Dr. Carol Boyce Davies, whom many of you may know as she is described on her website um, as, quote, a student first Caribbean American radical intellectual committed to social justice. 
Dr. Boyce Davies is the Frank H. T. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters in the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Africana Studies and English at Cornell University. Prior to joining the Cornell faculty, she was an award-winning professor at the State University of New York, Binghamton, and at Florida International University, where she was recruited to build the African Diaspora Studies program. Dr. Boyce Davies is the author of numerous publications. I'm just going to mention a few here, um, including the prize-winning Left of Karl Marx, The Political Life of Black Communist Claudia Jones, and Black Women, Writing and Identity, Migrations of the Subject. Dr. Boyce Davies has also published the critical editions, Gambika, Studies of Women in African Literature, and Out of the Kungla, Caribbean Women and Literature. From 2015 to 2016, she served as president of the Caribbean Studies Association. One of Dr. Boyce Davies' many accomplishments while at Florida International University was co-founding the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. And it is that experience along with others from her distinguished career that I look forward to discussing today. Dr. Boyce Davies, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jennifer, pleasure talking with you. Um, so if we can, I'd love to begin by discussing the genesis of the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. Um, I think that when you're on the outside looking in, especially for students, um, established programs seem like they've always existed when in fact, they grew out of initiatives that were once new and untested. Um, so would you mind speaking a bit about how the lecture series um, got its start? Um, yeah, why don't we start there? So, yes, Jennifer, it's a pleasure talking about this. Um, one of the really uh, major contributions we've made to the South Florida community, but also to the international community, because there are two Eric Williams lectures, one, is based in Trinidad and Tobago and is done at the Central okay. Bank. Um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to be able to attend that on one occasion and ours, right? So I came to FIU, Florida International University, recruited as you indicated, to build the African New World Studies Program as it was called then. Uh, now it's called the African Diaspora Studies Program. But it was an interesting conception because I think they wanted to work with the idea of Africa and the New World as a frame. Uh, mm -hmm. So before that, they had had a really big conference on the diaspora uh, organized by Carlos Moore in which people like Amy Sizzle mm -hmm. had attended and I think uh -huh. gave the um, program that naming. Um, so. I did not mind it at all. In fact, people are now talking more about New World. Mm -hmm. So when I got to FIU, my project um, as a director then was to find a way to put us on the map really quickly. And that was because there was no other program of its kind in the entire state of Florida. And we were like, as you know, people already, already uh, make a lot of comments about Florida being all on the outside, you know, all the problems, yeah. including new president, resident, um, <laughs> ex-president resident there now. Um, so mm -hmm. Florida always has that sort of mark of being Caribbean, um, not really quite in the United States and so on. So besides mm -hmm. the University of Florida Gainesville, which had an African studies program, there was nothing at all in terms of an African diaspora studies mm, okay. in the entire state. And I had come from a very energetic um, university culture at Binghamton, uh, relationships with Cornell, where we did a lot of work with Africana studies. And mm -hmm. so, so in many ways, I used some of that model of the Cornell Africana uh, Studies uh, Department, carried over a lot of the thinking about it into um, putting our program together. And, one of the key things we wanted to do, which Cornell is known for, was known for, was really having some distinguished lectures hmm. that bring to the campus a variety of really critical scholars in the field. And we created a distinguished lecture series. Around that same time, uh, Erica Williams, the daughter of former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Eric Williams, mm -hmm. heard about me being there and quickly made an arrangement to try to meet me. <laughs> I met and wanted to know how I could help her advance 
any of the things she was doing at that time. She mm -hmm. had about 18 or 19 items she wanted to do. Wow. So, but really one of the things we can do because we're creating a lecture series is probably create a lecture series uh, under the name of Eric Williams. Mm -hmm. so That's how we ended up doing that Eric Williams lecture. We put together um, our, our thoughts, our ideas about how to achieve it and who would be the best person to launch it. So we were really happy at that point uh, because she knew him well and I was able to make the contact to get uh, John Hope Franklin to be the first wow. a lecture. And that was an amazing feat in itself. And I have to say he was such an amazing, uh, distinguished uh, person that when I met with him at an Asala conference in Miami, mm -hmm. to, if he would do this and to tell him, we don't have a lot of money, but we want to do this. And he said, well, some people I charge a lot and some people I charge mm -hmm. nothing. <laughs> so I offered him something that was minimal and he accepted. So this is how the lecture started. So it became then part of the, the Distinguished Lecture Series and actually became the Distinguished Lecture. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it more and more morphed into bringing really high caliber um, lectures to campus and the surrounding community supported it and voila, there we go. Wow, thank you. What an amazing story, this convergence of personal and institutional um, resources. Um, wow, that's that's amazing. And to have Dr. John Hope Franklin as the inaugural lecturer, um, what 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 a legacy! Keep in mind that he he was happy to do it because mm -hmm. Franklin and Eric Williams he told me this shared mm -hmm. us when they were at Howard University. Oh my goodness! I know when they were young historians. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. No, so he said wow. he would. Yeah, he said he was ready to do that. So this is a, a convergence that really worked for us, and uh, we were happy of that. Of, to make that connection and of that legacy that they had mm -hmm. and that we brought them together again in yes. teaching that lecture. And what a, a brilliant reminder of, um, you know, how HBCUs have nurtured um, intellectuals from throughout the African diaspora, not just from within the United States and um, brought them together um, to meet each other as well as to meet um, with and uh, work with students. So Absolutely. that's a, I'm an HSU graduate and proud at multiple levels. Oh, I um, cannot uh, uh, say that. However, I am the daughter of an HBCU, a retired HBCU, 30 year employee and the sister of an HBCU graduate. So um, I've been able to appreciate um, the, the benefits of that um, culture through family, family ties. Uh, and, you know, I always stress that for people from Africa and the Caribbean, it was more significant to go to Howard and to Harvard. Mm. In fact, people often mixed up those two names, <laughs> similar, but they actually prefer Howard because of the history, because of who was there. And keep in mind, mm -hmm. in the days before, we had that major ability to go to um, historically white universities and colleges. This is where Black scholars were nurtured fully, right? And this is where... Mm -hmm. Everybody went and, and this is why you would have distinguished scholars like Eric Williams and uh, John Hope Franklin sharing offices at Howard. Mm -hmm. um, so the roster of speakers um, began with um, Dr. Franklin. It has included elected officials as well as scholars, activists and artists, um, and sometimes individuals whose experience spanned more than one of those categories. Was that mix an intentional part of the, the planning process to have people from all different backgrounds and professions? Absolutely. Well, the key thing we wanted to do since it was, as I said, uh, the, the genesis of it was an African diaspora lecture series and mm -hmm. so keeping in mind the nature of, of what we wanted to do, the combination of having people who worked in politics and history were fundamental, which would be the two critical areas that Williams would be known for contributing mm -hmm. to intellectually and in, in terms of political leadership. And then we also wanted, because it was diasporic, to make sure we had African scholars, okay. um, Caribbean scholars, mm -hmm. politicians, 
uh, and African-American scholars, politicians, and some combination of all of those three at times. Mm -hmm. So basically the combination of history politics and then try to have the spread of the African diaspora. Um, generally, um, I have to say spread in a limited way because we never got all the way to doing like Asia and, and mm -hmm. of the diaspora that are, that are further afield or even mm -hmm. or Latin America. But definitely the Anglophone um, contributions um, of these people would be fundamentally part of what we contributed and delivered to our community. And also we wanted to ensure that we had speakers who would be um, the kind of people that a community would learn from. So we wanted mm -hmm. to educate the community to bring the knowledge outside of the institutional frameworks. So mm -hmm. the datable scholarship then transferred in a public lecture to the community was really key to how we imagined it uh, unfolding and it did. So I'm glad to hear you mention community because I know that that is another important part of this um, lecture series. So it wasn't meant just to serve the FIU campus community, but as you mentioned, the larger South Florida community. So um, did you and your colleagues um, devise a special outreach plan? Um, I'm wondering how you cultivated, right, that community involvement, both because I'm interested in your particular experience with the, um, you know, Eric Williams like Memorial Lecture at FIU, and because I think this is a question that um, scholars are perennially facing, and it's one that we should face, right, in terms of bringing in our communities um, as opposed to just speaking at them or, um, you know, expecting them to find their way to our campuses. Right. A couple of ways, um, I suppose, but keep in mind, gradually, um, the word would spread in community context. Okay so that we ended up having more and more. But we use uh, a number of different strategies, definitely local media. So mm -hmm. the versions of these, I would go and Erica as well, would go on television, local ah. television shows mm -hmm. and interviews. Um, we went also on radio. We did a lot of community radio where people okay. carry uh, radio programs in particular, because that's mm -hmm. the ones we were targeting. But not just Caribbean, but also urban morning shows where okay. people listen in their, ta in their transportation to mm -hmm. for those. Um, and definitely also mailings and uh, uh, announcements in local newspapers as well. So we use all of the media possible in order to get to our audiences. And then of course, engage Caribbean organizations and had their support. But then we also, decided in the structuring of it to make sure that we had the kind of cultural fair that would make our communities want to take part. So mm -hmm. big it was having a really amazing layout of Caribbean food. Okay. So, you know, right? People, before the lecture, we would have like hors d'oeuvres and, you know, all kinds of drinks and punch, mm -hmm. not alcohol, of course. Um, and then we would have the lecture and then, mm -hmm we would have after that also desserts. So we had a really, it was not like heavy meal, but more like mm -hmm. evening, you know, foods that people would uh, enjoy having before the lecture. And the, the, actually the after part of it where we had desserts and stuff ended up accompanying what we would have um, uh, as a kind of unrolling of the event where the speaker gets a chance to mingle with the audience. Yeah. The words, mm -hmm. books, and that sort of thing. And of course, when we we had Angela Davis one year, and I'm sure you probably want to hear about that one. <laughs> over a thousand people, and more people lined up to get in around the wow. book, for example. And and that we had to end up using multiple uh, extra rooms with television mm -hmm. so that people could um, and te uh, television sets so that people could get a chance mm -hmm. to see the lecture. Um, and that was an amazing thing because we had to organize then a very um, deliberate way of people going to her to get their book signed. Otherwise, mm -hmm. somebody like that, it becomes quite an amazing conglomeration of people all trying to get to her at the same time. So that was one of the most memorable ones. I, in fact, when I got to the lecture before, about an hour before, mm -hmm. 
I was amazed when I saw the lines of people around the university trying to get <laughs> to the lecture. And that really um, was something else. That was like the most attended lecture we ever had. Mm -hmm. um, wow, a, a thousand people, that's, that's something. Um, yeah, in fact, the hall we used would seat about 400 people. Um, mm -hmm. So you could imagine having a thousand, what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> people were upset because many people could not get in after a while, we had to just stop. But mm -hmm. it, because it was Angela Davis, and in fact, this because we did uh, her had her as the lecturer, I think that really put us on the map completely. Because then the community mm -hmm. there was a lot of energy about attending, and mm -hmm. and um, and we got a lot of press and so on from it. So I'm still happy about how that turned out. Um, so I'd like to ask um, a follow up question. So you mentioned being surprised by the, the turnout um, for the Davis lecture. Um, were there any other lectures that um, were surprising or that um, remain in your memory as unusual? I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, at one point, we um, tried to have the mighty sparrow, the Trinidadian Calypso King. Mm -hmm. And it was all set to come. And then I, I believe he fell ill or something of the sort. So we still, because we had made a big deal of trying to have a lecture that would be also fun and what have you, mm -hmm. we had a, a Calypsonian who sang some of his songs and his own in conversation with a scholar uh, from University of the West Indies. So that was an, a Royal Gibbons, who is a, a, a playwright and person who works in theater. And actually, mm -hmm. long time ran the, the Caribbean uh, cultural arts program at University of the West Indies St. Augustine. Mm. That was memorable because people loved it because we had the interplay with the song and then him discussing what was going on at that time and so on. So he, he sang a number of songs that had to do with Eric Williams and, mm. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure, the Calypsonians are very critical of the government when they say it was not all laudatory, it was <laughs> them funny, some, you know, um, historical in terms of documenting mm -hmm. what was going on in the country at that time and so on and in Royal Gibbons. The Calypsonian's name was Lord Relator and he did a really amazing job of, of doing that. But then we actually had um, a, a real life Calypso monarch uh, whose name, who's the professor as well, and he was a school teacher, so his Calypso sobriquet was Chalk Dust, Hollis Liverpool was his mm -hmm. name. So he was also quite another um, amazing uh, contributor. So that stood out because again, we wanted it not to just be um, intellectual, political level discussions, but also to educate community in using culture, using different um, approaches to doing that. But then we also had Hillary Beckles, um, mm -hmm. who is an amazing speaker, but also now, of course, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. But he's, a, I would highly recommend him as a speaker because he's been working, he's the foremost person working on Caribbean reparations, yeah. mm -hmm. Caribbean reparations council. So all of that process about what they're doing and how they're moving it forward. Um, mm -hmm really important to hear from him. So those are the ones I mentioned really um, importantly, but we had Kenneth Kaunda, the president of Zambia. Wow. Um, not, not a very exciting lecture because he probably prepared in a way, he was talking about AIDS and it was a difficult time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in South Africa who experienced a died of AIDS. So I remember people feeling lovely to see him and he had a signature white handkerchief he always had in his hand whenever you saw him. So he mm -hmm. had, with him and so on. So that was also quite significant um, to have somebody like him, but we've had Portia Simpson Miller, right? Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. period when she um, was not the prime minister, but had been, and that was also significant to have her talk because she was able to, in a way, communicate some of her experience of having been a prime minister, but also was still in the process of planning, of course, another run, and she did win in the succeeding election, and we had her. And in fact, I'm really pleased to say I went to the inauguration uh, mm. for her the following year, and she um, was so happy when she saw me. She said, "Ah, oh, FIU." So <laughs> it 
distinctly remembered um, the lecture and the fact that she came uh, to us as a special guest as well. Thank you. Um, I, I love hearing that background and that context. And um, I have to say, um, when I am back in the classroom um, and when I'm wrapping up a session and um, dusting off the chalk from my fingers, I'll now think about it differently. Um, okay. I didn't know that that was the, the backstory for um, right. uh, Professor Liverpool's um, sobriquet. So um, I, I love that. I'll think about the chalk dust differently from now on. Right, also we had writers in one year we <laughs> And we had um, um, Robert Fatton, who does um, Haiti, History of Haiti, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. University of Virginia. But then we also had Edwidge Danticat at this mm. time. So she was talking about it from a historical point of view, and she gave us the literary side. So we try to be innovative and in a way, sometimes then bringing combinations of scholars and writers together if it worked out. And a really amazing version of that we had, which is still one of my most memorable lectures is that we brought together three women to talk about Caribbean women in politics, which mm -hmm. is a very timely topic, which is something I'm working on myself. Um, and one of them now is the Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, Honorable mm -hmm. Mia Atley. Back then she was a young woman, she was Attorney General, she's still, mm -hmm. uh, but she was the Attorney General of Barbados. But I say young because of the group, we had Beverly Manley, who was the wife of okay. former of the former prime minister, Michael Manley. And then we also had a woman who was the minister of defense of uh, Bahamas, Honorable Cynthia Pratt, which was also amazing because she talked about the fact that normally women were not given those kinds of political positions. So we had the three of them speak uh, on the same panel about issues that have to do with women. And the nice thing we do have, and this is something I would really strongly recommend, we tape all of them and then have them available okay. as videotapes. So some of them are available and uh, people can get them from the Eric Williams Memorial Collection uh, because some of those are uh, historical pieces now, clearly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting us know about that uh, resource. Um, so I'd like to um, shift the conversation a bit um, to something that students of Caribbean studies probably already know. Um, so I mentioned in your introduction that your career has included a number of administrative roles, including serving as president of the Caribbean Studies Association. Um, and so would you mind talking about what some of the guiding principles of your career um, have been um, as a scholar, as an administrator, um, as someone who remains connected to the community as well as student-centered? Right. Well, you know, we began by talking about being raised in an HBCU context. So I still mm -hmm. credit that experience because in each of those situations, I was mentored and um, encouraged and trained by people who were so supportive, who anything you wanted to do would say, yeah, do that. Um, so therefore, the, the kind of barriers that people sometimes ran into in the sort of historically white institutions where they felt unloved and not um, supported and so on were not part of my experience at all. So I have to say that that's the formation mm -hmm. that is powered uh, at a time period when um, CLR James was still a professor at Howard. Mm -hmm. I took a class with him, but I visited and sat in his classes and so on. Um, and an amazing range of Black uh, uh, scholars came through Howard at that time. So my framing then on my understanding of intellectual work is guided by a certain kind of engagement with the political intellectual combinations of, mm. of scholarship, what that means, called by some the ra Black radical intellectual tradition or the Caribbean radical intellectual tradition. Mm -hmm narrow it all the way in. But that black radical intellectual tradition then is what I, I would say orients me and therefore allows me to make decisions about how I work with community and with students. And the point is many of us who struggled with issues that have to do with institutional racism, we remember always that we come from families who really struggled to make sure we got what we needed regardless of how well off we were, there was mm -hmm. a thing that you did not have that somebody else provided 
uh, in terms of support, in terms of praying for you, in mm -hmm. terms of encouraging you and all of those things. So my sense of intellectual work is not the sort of isolated scholar who is unable to engage, but one who really sees that whole process as an ongoing exchange of information and knowledge. Uh, so I remember as an undergrad having um, some of my mother's male friends <laughs> challenge me and say, I'm sure they never told you anything about Gavi at that university because you're showing that you're going to college, right? They're like, yeah, what is about Gavi? So, so in other words, the community knowledge is not to be discarded. It has to be enhanced. It has to be correct mm -hmm. sometimes because sometimes it's, it's often not advanced all the way to what people have found out in terms of the current scholarship, but it's still nevertheless scholarship. It's, it's knowledge, I should say, that needs mm -hmm. developed. And therefore, this is the context in which I saw always my educational um, acquisition of an educational pathway and a deg uh, degrees that allow me to do that. And mm -hmm. then moving forward, and an another example I would give, when I was at Binghamton, I remember we had a really horrible situation of the KKK actually trying to come on campus to mm -hmm. the talk they wanted. And they were actually being supported by the young Republicans, which doesn't even surprise me now that I look mm -hmm. kind of conjunction of the Republican party with white supremacy has been there consistently. Uh, anyway, I was talking to an older woman in the community and feeling like really demoralized about the fact that we were always those of us who would critiquing that kind of, of those kinds of positions would mm -hmm. all be in trouble, the, you know, the right-wing papers may write us up or something. And she turned and said to me, well, if people like you who went to university, got a degree um, and have the ability to speak, cannot speak, then none of us can speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, she gave me the authority. She gave me the, the right then mm -hmm. to be able to use whatever knowledge I have then to advance any position that is useful to my communities. And of course, to make sure that students also feel that they mm -hmm. are as well to participate. So for the Eric Williams lecture, we always had student participation as well. We tried to engage the Caribbean Student Association so that mm -hmm. they come. And often they were like um, ushers or they did the microphones okay. when mm -hmm. the community had conversations, um, questions, sorry, for speakers. Often they wore, you know, organized themselves so they wore similar clothing and they mm -hmm. were always professionally positioned. So working with the student groups who are related is really a critical part of getting that student support as well. The other thing we did with students was have um, local universities, particularly if it was a lecture that or a class that was relevant, we would have them come and bring students. So we've had people like Florida Memorial University come with in a class with students um, from their university. And I remember always giving them a shout out from the podium so that they knew <laughs> that we knew they were there. So, <laughs> you know, it's like a lot of Memorial University is in the house and so on. So we, we try to make sure that we had them as well. Miami-Dade Community okay. College. Mm -hmm. okay. Miami-Dade College, it used to be community college, but Miami-Dade College as well. The North Campus and the, and the downtown campuses as well. And also, Erica did a really nice, Erica Williams, that is, Connell, Erica Williams Connell did a nice thing in that she worked with one of the professors from Miami Dade College, Leroy Lashley, and she would have him do an interview with the speaker before the lecture, and that okay. was taped, and mm -hmm. also part of the archives of the event, and that was always a wonderful thing to do. Sometimes it was televised, but it was often taped and then kept as a document as well. Um. Thank you. I um, there's so much rich um, content in your answer. Um, maybe I'll just uh, draw out one because this um, speaks to conversations that I've had with many a student, undergraduate and graduate, who have been concerned about their time in academia. You know, whether it's for a four-year undergraduate program or for a graduate program estranging them from their community. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate um, how you shared, you know, that ethos that is central to the HBCU mission, which is that education 
is part of community and you know scholarship should be connected to um, community and that's that's what I try to encourage students to, to see or to think or to believe but I think that your answer um, and your career exemplify that um, so you don't have to leave your community behind um, regardless of what social forces campus forces are telling you you can make your relationship to your community part of your studies and part of your work um, and uh, move forward in life that way rather than feeling as if you have to straddle separate um, separate worlds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say um, hopefully, um, I think this next uh, generation of students understand that fully um, mm -hmm. tell because what surprised so many of us is the extent to which this sort of um, primitive racial practice um, that people assumed had gone away, a return mm -hmm. with a vengeance. So most um, students now come to the university and I was looking, we were looking at applications for grad school all of this week. <laughs> the, the students who come to university now already are coming with a sense of wanting that they're wanting their work to not just be uh, remote from um, some sort of contribution to community. So I'm optimistic that this next generation mm -hmm. coming through is gonna be a generation that wants to use knowledge and service so that it's not just one or the other, but that there's mm -hmm. an certain kind of scholarly choices one makes as well, the kind of work one does and the kind mm -hmm. of way one gives back uh, that knowledge. Because it's, again, this is a, the point of the lecture, of course, not so much that one just um, um, enjoys at the university level the benefit of having a great speaker, but then mm -hmm. can it up. And now we are fortunate to have the technologies precisely to make things more open. Um, that's one of the side effects of, of the pandemic and the lockdown that we have all the technologies now to be able to reach people internationally. Mm -hmm. so I'm happy about that as well. Uh, you know, one other thing that I'll, I'll touch on from your, um, your response um, is, and I think you're absolutely right, young people today um, are very mindful of um, these connections um, and more mindful than their predecessors were in a lot of ways. Um, and I think there's also an awareness um, that has you know, likely come into sharper relief in these last 18 months or so that anti-racist work is not limited to one particular geographic site. So you shared your experience at Binghamton. And I mentioned this because I, so I grew up in Tennessee and Memphis. And I remember being uh, in upstate New York at Cornell as a graduate student um, and encountering several people who asked me if I were relieved to be out of the South. And I was so puzzled by that, by that because I thought, do you think there are not racist and that there is not anti-racist work to be done above the Mason-Dixon line? Because I'm pretty sure this is a national and indeed, right? hemispheric diasporic um, issue that we must um, contend with. Um, so I think your um, experience speaks to that. And again, I see young people having an awareness of that, um, that anti-racist work um, is not limited to a single place and should not be limited to a single voice or to a single uh, community, but should be a collective endeavor. Absolutely, it's clearly. Um... Well, first of all, one of the things that, that we say all the time to students and I coming from the Caribbean uh, and hearing African students and Caribbean students say they did not know about racism until they came mm -hmm. to the United States. Um, racism is a global phenomenon with different manifestations in different locations. So that um, in the Caribbean, the assumption was that you did not run into racism, but you did if you um, had a structure where color was really coded already so that you didn't okay. even realize the school you went to were only girls mm -hmm. were certain color of you. Um, banks and, and many places of employment, um, even things like airline stewardess work. I used to tell um, mm. I students then and they're quite surprised that you have to look like a beauty queen and be a certain color <laughs> to become an airline. <laughs> now anybody can do that job. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
um, older women, whatever. Um, but but they were already, even in carnival, even residential patterns, but they were also country clubs. And I was quite surprised. Um, yeah, I went, uh, not too long ago, actually, I went home for an event of a friend of mine who was singing, she sings in one of those cultural groups. Um, and I went with her, it was held in a country club and I was amazed the audience was predominantly white. And I was like, how could this be in Trinidad? Wow. So basically, I mean, anywhere you go, we could do, look at Haiti, we could look at different islands and see the scene. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the codes may not be as visible. They may not be as known, but clearly one sees them. And I have the benefit of having lived and traveled in a few locations where I can testify that, that racism is indeed global. And that if you had a colonial structure, you had a form of racism built into that. And therefore um, uh, you experienced it sometimes without really frontally having the visible markers that were part of the United States framing. And I think that's the distinction that one has to understand that the United States had a very specific Jim Crow framing of racism. Mm -hmm. Did all these separate structures actually visibly marked with signs and so on. In a lot of places they weren't marked, but you you knew you couldn't go there because you weren't part of that community or you were not, you didn't even imagine that certain um, places could be part of this, the locational movement that you had as a person. So that's how it works. And it works like that in almost every place I've been, even in Africa, in, 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 in the continent. We were in Senegal um, last year and we went, a few of us were on Gori Island of all places, mm -hmm. to eat in a restaurant and we, then we ordered and then we noticed a, a group of white people came in after us and somehow they got served first. So we were like, what's going on here? And um, in fact, they noticed, we told them, we, you know, we mm -hmm. were and we were like, yeah, you need to notice that you got served first. And they were like, oh my God, what can we do about this? So we brought it to the attention of the waiter and waitress. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh my God. So sometimes it's just automatic that they get a certain service or you go in the line to check in a hotel and a white man is behind you and they suddenly reach to him to tell him, sir, can I help you? Like, hello, I'm standing. So basically the racial patterns and structures I'm seeing and codings that we often take for granted or assume mm -hmm. as, um, and we don't see them as part of the sort of global racism that operates as opposed to the visible markers. Now keep in mind the United States version of racism would be what would inform apartheid South Africa as well. Okay. The assumption mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, that, that these were more heinous um, patterns of racism, but mm -hmm. they were by the United States. So the United States is one of the hardcore <laughs> racist <laughs> structures where white supremacy is part of the framework founded on indigenous people's genocide, founded on right. Africans. Uh, so with settler colonies like Canada and the United States, we're running into that definite kind of structuring of racism. Mm -hmm. So, um, So you, have traveled extensively, um, as uh, your answer um, just now indicated. You've studied, you've taught, you've, lect you've lectured, not only in the Caribbean and in the US, but also in Nigeria, Brazil, China, Ghana, among many other places. Um, could you talk a bit about how you've seen the fields of Caribbean studies and African diaspora studies across time and place. So um, how do audiences in China respond to a distinguished lecturer in African diaspora studies? Um, yeah, I, I just would well, love China, to hear you talk more China, about that. I was a uh, um, visiting professor in China in 2014 on a full, on a, as a visiting professor, not a Fulbright. Okay. Prof. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I, I found was that the students tend to have a very specific kind of um, connection with the United States based on popularity. So everybody wanted to write a dissertation on Toni Morrison or mm. write papers okay. on Morrison or mm -hmm. Alice Walker, for example. But I, you would have to tell them then there are many more writers. So the question is there in my case was to sort of expand their knowledge base so that there were a lot more options for them. And that worked. That totally worked. In fact, one of my students, uh, leading students right now is a guy named Zifeng Liu, who was 
I saw him sitting in the classroom and he had a book by Houston Baker. And I thought, that's interesting. How come he has a Houston Baker book? But he's somebody who was interested in African-American literature period. So he had taken a couple courses already in mm -hmm. that area and was able then to relate. He took me to the National Library and I was looking to show me what their holdings were. And I was quite surprised they had my work, but I think it's because of Claudia Jones, um, uh, left of Karl Marx that was kind of popularly known then and read there. So Claudia Jones was there um, and several other works that I had done. I was quite happy to see that. So basically left scholarship is available and present um, and because of it being China, but then there are several other options as well that, that one notes. But I taught uh, writing classes, but I use things like County Cullens, we wear the mask. And I was telling students how amazing it is when I, when the pandemic started, I was one of the first poems I used by County Cullens. Oh. But I was telling them when I taught that in China, students then gave me so many examples about wearing the mask in their culture. And they were mm -hmm. like, you wear masks for all kinds of things. They showed me the performance where you know, there's a performance where the guy does like 10 or 12 different masks and so on. So the cultural meanings of masking are really quite interesting. And then you have students in the United States now able to understand that in relation to uh, how one camouflages one fe one's feelings when confronted by policemen, for example, or how waitress behaves when she is serving you or not in order to not show how she really feels or what have you. So that people wear masks of all sorts. We talked about that, but then linked it to the question of, of people having to wear an actual mask now, what that means <laughs> in the United States. And we also have been making fun of the fact that for a long time, the United States um, conservative culture made a mockery of women wearing veils and wearing coverings, facial coverings and so on. And now really, that's like the latest, hottest way of being in the world. So, I mean, they're Gucci masks, they're all kinds of masks now. So people are covering in different ways and I'm seeing all sorts of versions of masking um, being identified. So we, I think all of these things are situational. I think hopefully we learn from that. So that's one of the experiences I've had from being in a place like China that, that showed us how um, different cultures engage each other, but what the knowledge levels are and how one constantly has to expand that knowledge base so that people get more information each time, which is what we're supposed to be doing, right? As teachers. It is, <laughs> it is, yes. Um, yeah. So um, not just um, resting on our laurels, but growing and engaging um, as we right. um, teach and interact with um, students and colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, so in this spirit of thinking about um, change um, over time, um, you know, I think as a final question, I'd like to ask you um, to reflect on where you think the fields of Caribbean studies and African diaspora studies might be um, heading. I know that, um, you know, Cornell um, as well as many um, Africana studies programs under, you know, various names uh, in the country, San Francisco State, um, uh, at the University of Texas, were founded in the late um, 1960s and observed their 50th anniversaries, um, you know, roughly two to three years ago. So where do you see the, those fields heading? Um, if you were to project mm. into the next 50 years, wow. um, yeah, it's a little, um, I don't know. It's a little disturbing for me um, even to think about that. I think there are a lot of things that we should have done that have not been done. Mm -hmm. uh, then the institutions themselves limited, I think the possibilities. So I often am guided by an essay that Sylvia Winter wrote called and how we mistook the map for the territory. Basically, mm -hmm. she he argues there, and she used to be part of the group that was called the Institute for the Black World in Atlanta. And I think they were doing a lot of studies about what these studies would look like in this contemporary period. Mm -hmm. The argument there was that we kind of made a number of gestures to get to a different intellectual place, but we really never got there all the way. So mm -hmm. that people end up being sometimes um, marginalized from the institutions. So at Cornell, for example, which is a place that you know and that I know, 
um, students who are, are complaining that they feel that the Africana unit is too far away. Now they don't have the knowledge of the fact that Africana's building, which was closer into the main campus, was burnt. Uh, there was an arson of that build, mm -hmm. arson of that building in 1970, and that is why they moved further out to the North Campus. But the students are saying that they would like a more central location for mm -hmm. Africana because they feel if they are taking classes in the veterinary school, they have a hard time getting all the way back to the North Campus and so on. So I think probably different um, ways of, of being more um, accessible, I think in different kinds of models would have to be thought out for the future. So that it's not just um, um, sort of an enclave where we are able to do the kind of work we want in an isolated way, but that we have different ways of being in each unit. So I think one of the things that doesn't happen is that different departments need to really make sure that each of their units are infused with knowledge from our fields, and they're not. So undergrad directors and grad directors should be really ensuring that their students take these courses, but they don't. So how to do that? I think that would be the kind of work for the future uh, without losing our, our sense of who we are, but really infusing into all those areas would take a little bit more effort on the part of the institution, but also on the part of our departments. So the fact that um, the president, this current president Biden, is talking about ways to talk about institutional racism, I think the institutions of higher learning themselves also need to address that. And this is one of the methods they can do that. Besides, um, like Cornell is trying to start an anti-racist center, students mm -hmm. want this, and many schools are doing that. But in a way, in African studies and or African diaspora studies in the origins were intending to do that kind of work, but they often don't anymore. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a space there for that. So what do we do? I think just keep going, but making sure that we um, create new generations of students and grad students, undergrad, who are able now to take those discussions further and advance them um, by the various means that we use, teaching, the lectures that we're talking about, the series, mm -hmm. so on, but also going international, I think that's the other piece we'll have to really work on. Well, thank you so much. This is, um, as I started out saying, I'll close by saying this has really been an honor. I've been, enjoyed our conversation immensely. I know you're busy, um, so we won't um, take up more of your time. Um, but thank you for speaking with us today. And here's hoping that we're able to have an in-person conversation um, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Absolutely, and I hope this works out beautifully and congratulations on getting the Eric Williams lecture. You're definitely going to enjoy doing this in this new iteration. Thank you. Thank you.